on this episode of the Social Hour. Netflix is sorry. And Facebook is complicated. But Facebook also might be musical pretty soon. Early is really great for parties. And how about that holler? It's definitely a better name than Quickster. All that and Clue for the Lou on the Social Hour. Netcasts you love. From people you trust. This is Twit. Bandwidth for the Social Hour is brought to you by Cashfly at C A C H E F L Y dot com. This is the Social Hour with Sarah Lane and Amber MacArthur. Episode 26, recorded Monday, September 19th, 2011. This episode of the Social Hour is brought to you by Audible.com. To download a free audiobook of your choice, go to audiblepodcast.com slash social hour. And by Netflix. Watch thousands of TV episodes and movies on your PC, Mac, iPad, iPhone, or TV instantly. All stream directly to you, saving you time, money, and hassle. For your free 30-day trial, go to netflix.com slash twit. Hello, everybody, and welcome to another edition of The Social Hour. We are on episode 26, and from Petaluma, California, at the Twit Brick House, I am Sarah Lane. And I'm Amber MacArthur from the Gaston Airport in Texas. Uh, a what little are you doing bit, there? Uh, I, I know, I'm, I'm uh, uh, far from home right now, Sarah, but I was just speaking at an event this morning in San Antonio, and uh, I was speaking to uh, Cavenders. There's a, they're a big maker of Western wear, hence, for people here watching the feed, I know that listeners can't. But I'm wearing a cowboy hat they gave me. So having a lot of fun in Texas. I've only been here for, I don't know, 12 hours, but I've already indulged in the Texan culture. Very nice. Very nice. Well, I think you you were taken out to some sort of local hamburger joint. I think you mentioned on Twitter and Kelly Lewis said, tell us what you think, because, of course, she knows all about Texan cuisine. And so delicious. I've been following your adventures, your short uh, time spent in San Antonio anyway. <laughs> Our time, yeah, it's been really fun. It was funny. We stayed at a, a a nice resort, kind of up in the hills outside of San Antonio. And when I got there, my flights were all delayed, and it was close to midnight. And they put me in this little cabin near the woods, which was very exclusive. And I mean, you would have just loved it if you were there in the day, but at night it had this really creepy feel. You know, you're coming into the woods and you're alone in the little cabin. Um, so it was. It's been an adventure all around, Sarah. But great group, had lots of fun, and uh, got some good gear too. Right on. Well, I'm glad that you were able to figure out how to Skype in from an airport, even wearing your cowboy hat, and do the social hour today. I know we're, for anyone watching the live feed, we're starting a little bit late today, but it all worked out pretty well. Oh, we lost Amber, didn't we? It's okay. That I just restarting my video. So okay. I'll just, if that happens again, I'll just do the same thing. Perfect. Yeah, it's uh, starting a little bit late, but fortunately, uh, I got an earlier flight, so uh, at least we can still do the show. Perfecto. Well, th we got to start off with it's 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 a social story and it isn't a social story, but I think that the 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 whole idea of CEOs having really good communication with their customers when you're a CEO of a big company like Netflix does become a big social story. Uh, last night, so Sunday night, uh, sort of after a lot of the even the weekend workers had put away their blogging tools. Everybody got back online and started talking about the fact that Reed Hastings uh, took to the Netflix blog to tell everybody that he was sorry that Netflix had not been better at communicating to their users why they had split the DVD rental and the streaming rental pricing structures. That was earlier in the year. They've had mm -hmm. a lot of backlash. Uh, for anybody that isn't a Netflix user, it pretty much went from you could have one or both to, uh, you could still have one or both, but the pricing effectively doubled if you wanted to use the DVD service and the streaming service. People like me said, ah, I only use streaming anyway, so it doesn't really matter. Um, the DVD service is just an extra service that I don't need anymore. But a lot of people were really upset about this. Didn't make a lot of sense. They couldn't figure out why the price was going up so much when Netflix was at the same time losing deals, lucrative deals with companies like Stars, for example, that, that have a lot of titles that people are interested in, a lot of newer movies. And it turns out that Netflix is spinning off its DVD rental service completely, and they're even going to call it a different name. It's going to be called Quickster, which if you say, okay, Quickster, uh, how do I even spell that? It's Q-W-I-K-S-T-E-R, <laughs> but I don't know, Amber, the whole thing sounds complicated. Yeah, you know what? It's so funny. I feel so out of 
because uh, I must have been traveling yesterday when this all went down, so I don't know a lot about it. Um, but uh, a, a bit of a surprise. So, I mean, is he sort of being commended for how he's opened up to, to the public and blogged and sort of been the, the face of what's going on right now? Or are people still increasingly critical? Well, it's interesting. So I, when I looked at this blog last night, they've got uh, Facebook uh, comments that are enabled um, on Netflix's blog. It's blog.netflix.com. And when I read his post last night, there were about 500 comments, and they had, I mean, it, there were quite a few comments in a short amount of time. And Reed Hastings was, you could see him in the comment threads, uh, responding to as many people as possible, and responding to people who were really skewering him, like, this is the worst idea, God, you guys are over. There was a lot of praise, though, too. Thank you for mm -hmm. being so transparent. We understand now. It makes a little bit more sense. Even if we don't agree with what Netflix is doing, hey, you've got you're on a path, you believe that this is the right thing to do, so thanks for being honest with us. But it's real. I mean, it's really kind of, I, I don't even know if it's a 50-50. I think people are still pretty upset with Netflix, and I think part of it is, right, right now, by the way, there are 14,642 comments on this blog post. Um, that's amazing it can even handle that capacity. <laughs> I, I, I know. It's, that's, I mean, it's the sort of thing, you know, Mark Zuckerberg would get on Facebook itself if he were to post something really, you know, I interesting about Facebook's um, go going forward. But it, it seems like people are very divided on whether uh, Hastings should have done this a long time, of, time ago, um, mm. if, 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 they, if they appreciate what he's doing. I mean, at this point, I think Netflix says our stock has gotten hammered. A lot of people have said, we're, we're, we're leaving Netflix for good, you're over, you, you don't deserve our money anymore. Um, in the past, Netflix has been pretty vocal about saying, listen, we have quite a bit of turnover. Customers come, customers go, and a lot of people that are going to leave might have been leaving anyway, and we'll get new customers, and this is just sort of the evolution of our product. Clearly, mm -hmm. they care very much about streaming. Clearly, that's where they believe the business is going. That's why the streaming portion of their dual business is still going to be called Netflix. The DVD business, which is the Netflix legacy, is what gets the new name, Quickster. There's still gonna be red envelopes coming to people's houses. They'll have a new logo, though. And what really, uh, I, th I think, is, is upsetting people. Oh, and by the way, the, the DVD rental service is also gonna include games. So it's something that they, they still feel like not only should they be committed to it, but they can actually grow the business. I mean, it's a billion dollar business. Uh, in yeah. But uh, is that the two companies will not share the same data so that if I were to uh, you know, rate a movie on one service um, or figure out if it's available on one service, I mean, they just have two completely different databases, two different um, uh, credit card accounts that you would need for both. So a lot of people That's like that about Netflix. Yeah, so it's like... I think I feel like I, I see where Netflix is going. I think that they, they feel that they have to do this, um, but it's, it, it's, it's complicated for a lot of their user base. And so it's an interesting social experiment to see how they deal with all this backlash because clearly they feel like they, they didn't speak up enough until now, and now they're, they're really going for it as far as being very open and honest and interactive. Well, I guess that's all you can do. I mean, I think this is, you know, there are risks uh, and uh, rewards to opening up in the social space, especially for someone at the executive level. And this is a perfect example of that is, you know, it's amazing you can you talk to your customers, but at the end of the day, they, you know, they want to kind of dictate the direction of the company. But, you know, people don't always know what is the right direction, I, I guess, you know, so at least it's an open. Um, but uh, it's good to see them dealing with it. 14,000 comments, Sarah. I would not want to be the community manager in charge of uh, navigating or weeding through all of the feedback there. That would not be a fun, uh, a fun job at all. I know. And Hastings himself, I mean, he was commenting, half of the comments were from him, at least of the hundred I read or so last night before I went, okay, I kind of get the idea of, of, of how people are divided on the issue. But at some point... Yeah. This would be a full-time job for him, at least for the oh, next yeah. week, if he doesn't let somebody else take over um, getting, getting feedback out to the masses. Hard to say. Yeah. I mean, I guess, you know, the, the good thing about it is he'll, he'll understand and is a good sample size for what people actually think of what they're doing. So it's a sort of instant, no need necessarily to do uh, focus groups anymore like we used to do. Um, you can get it all there at once. Exactly. There's uh, more news in the big social network space 
this week, later in the week, uh, Facebook's F8 conference, that's their developer conference, is happening on Thursday. In fact, uh, Twit's going to do a special starting at 10 a.m. Pacific, uh, stream really it nice. live and have commentary. But uh, there's already some news trickling out about what is going to be the big announcement at F8. We've heard a little bit, well, we've heard quite a bit, actually, here and there in different installments about how Facebook is going to team up with music services to allow people to share music, like music, uh, be able to listen to music through the Facebook interface. But it's now, it seems pretty clear that this Thursday is when uh, these services will roll out. So that's services like Spotify, Mog, RDO, um, Rhapsody, uh, that will be playable from within Facebook. You'll be able to, to hook up your account. You know, they would actually act as a tab, almost like the games tab within Facebook. Not only that, though, you can share what you're listening to. You can recommend a song to a Facebook friend, which seems like, I, I mean, it's, it's a great boon for the music companies, especially some of the smaller ones. I'm an RDO user these days. Yep. Um, I've, I, I, I really like it. I feel like they've got pretty much everything I'm always searching for as far as music goes, but, but they're a much smaller company than, than Spotify, for example. I mean, I think RDO has under 100,000 users, and Spotify you know, had 100,000 users in the U.S. within its first couple of days of being live here, so I wonder how much... Is it, it's sort of like, because Facebook is such a, such a, just a beast, that the more Spotify songs get shared, just because more people are using it off the bat, the more Spotify becomes the winner. I know. Oh, it's really interesting because I, I, I mean, I use Facebook and I love Facebook, but I don't find I sort of go there and spend time there, you know, in the sense that I sort of check in every once in a while and then pull back out. Um, I know a younger generation uses it a little bit differently, I think. Sarah, I don't know if you know people like teenagers, they sort of sit on it or have it on their mobile phones longer. Um, but I kind of wonder if, you know, with Facebook, because they're always releasing something new, you know, announced uh, smart lists and subscriptions. I'm starting to almost ignore some of these new announcements and I've been doing this on and off for the, you know, the better part of the last year because there's just so much and there's so much there. Whereas Google Plus, one of the things that I like about it is just that it's sort of a streamlined version of Facebook. Like I almost wish I could strip out of Facebook and just have, you know, specific things almost like build my own Facebook experience, right? Yeah, i totally with you. Facebook has, it's... <laughs> I think of it as a chore, uh, mm. and that is not the way to think about social. It's like once social networks become a chore, I know this is not, there's something wrong. There's something off about this, and I do feel the same way about Google+, Plus. but I felt this way about Facebook for a while, which is also why last week, we didn't have a chance to talk about this on the Social Hour last Monday because it came later in the week, but Facebook has uh, done a lot with trying to improve lists, making smart yes. lists where they help you try to categorize lists very, very similar to Google Plus Circles, although Google Plus Circles say, you put whoever you want into whatever circle you want, it's, it's in your hands. And Facebook is saying, we'll try to help you right off the bat. Um, and they also added the option to let people subscribe to your profile so that, Amber, if you and I weren't friends, but you were interested in what I was doing, you could subscribe mm -hmm. to my public updates, then I would have the option to uh, uh, update publicly, very much like Google Plus, or yep. just update to my family list or any sort of list that I end up um, creating. But I don't, I'm not sure I feel like that's the right idea. I already have a page and I don't know how to migrate all those people over to my profile. And it's like, I would never want to ask somebody to resubscribe. It's like, it's sort of a mess. And I know a lot of people who don't have public pages say, well, that doesn't really apply to us. But I wonder how many people who don't have public pages are going to have a bunch of people who are subscribing to them. It, 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 Facebook, the whole thing was like, if it's your friend, then be friends on Facebook. And if you're not friends, then maybe you don't want to be mm -hmm. Facebook friends. And now it's like another layer of complexity that I'm not sure I understand. Well, Sarah, I, you know, I have to ask you, as much as I love Facebook and I love brand pages and I think it's a really amazing platform, but it scares me to see them maybe go the direction of MySpace. Do you remember how my, MySpace and sort of glory days started to get it so cluttered with just information and features and functionality and uh, it just became so messy? 
agency that no one in their right mind who had a busy life would ever want to spend any time in there. It was just stressful. <laughs> so I hope they don't go that direction because I, I think they have a really good thing. And it, it just seems like, like you said, these different layers that they're adding on to it, it's just, um, it, it, it just is going to be too much for what should be a really simple experience. Raven, uh, Ravena, Ravina S2 in, in chat says, I agree with Leo. Facebook has lost its way. It forgot who its core users are and what they use it for. I'm not sure that I would go that far. I think that Facebook wants to be everything to everyone. Mm -hmm. And that is what, I, Amber, I think you and I are both struggling with. Well, it's, but it's, 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 it's too overwhelming uh, because well, yeah. it is trying to be everything to everyone. I already feel like, I mean, I know that we're in a different situation in the sense that maybe we have more public facing profiles, but I always, I already feel like my Facebook life is out of control. And what I mean by that is, you know, I had my personal page and then I started the fan page and now I was really very orderly about the whole experience just because there's just so much stuff there. Mm -hmm. So when something gets like that for me, I just, I, not that I abandon it, but it just, again, I just have to use the uh, analogy of MySpace. It, fe it feels to me a little bit like that. It's like one of the reasons I left MySpace is I went in there and everything was blinking and flashing and there was just too often people I didn't know were there and all of a sudden I'm like it's like going to that bar where you used to love it because it was just like cheers and all your friends and then all of a sudden there's tons of there's everyone in there and you know it just doesn't become a, a familiar or friendly place anymore and I think they could run that risk yeah absolutely also and now maybe I just have bad luck here but when smart lists were introduced last week on Facebook I heard a lot of people saying wow this is actually, Facebook is r pretty spot on about the people that I would have put into my close friends um, group list anyway. Well, my family list um, suggestions, they give me five suggestions just off the bat. None of these people I'm related to. So just goes <laughs> to show you, they're all lovely people that I know, but they're not my relatives. So, it's so not funny. that smart. Not, not that too smart. smart. Yeah, that, that's the risk of calling something smart. You know, it actually has to work. If it doesn't, it's a, the joke's on you, never fun. Um, so, Sarah, I'll, I'll do our little quick reminder here that we record the social live. At so we're live every Monday at uh, 2 p.m. Eastern, uh, 11 uh, a.m. Pacific, although that's known to uh, change a little bit. It's the start of the week, and sometimes our schedules uh, push it forward or back. Uh, our website is twit.tv slash TSH. Uh, the new website looks Oh, Sarah, I love it. It looks fantastic. Uh, and of course, you can email us at the social hour at twit.tv because we love getting your feedback. And uh, I'm pretty sure we have some this show too. Absolutely. Yes. Thank you so much for uh, your feedback. We love reading all of your questions and comments and tips and tricks. And, and we try to uh, add as much of that into every show, which we will uh, later in this episode as well. First, before we get any further, we want to thank audible.com for sponsoring this episode of the social hour if you're not familiar with audible you are missing out because they have over 75,000 audiobook titles when I say audiobook you think oh, I don't know like war and peace kind of thing yes but also nonfiction uh, Amber's a big nonfiction fan uh, periodicals sure. even you can get you can get the New Yorker read to you for example I mean it's 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 more than meets the eye really uh, when you poke around audible a podcast.com slash social hour. That's actually our special URL where you can get a free audiobook of your choice. You'll get a sense of just what kinds of offerings you can get. Uh, again, yeah, New York Times Audio Digest, for example. You get Jane Lynch's new book. Uh, you can get, uh, you can read War and Peace if you really want to. I'm actually, um, right now, I'm in the process, and I was telling Amber before the show, of trying to teach myself French. And it's, I don't know how well it's going to end, but I thought, oh, you know, since I'm in the car so much, why don't I search Audible and see if there are any, I don't know, like French uh, beginner audiobook um, tutorial type things. So I went ahead and just typed into the search bar uh, French, uh, uh, I think it was French lessons. And I have all sorts of options here. A lot of uh, learn, French, uh, learn French with Alexa, Learn French, the ultimate getting started with French box set, lessons one through 55, French lessons, a novel. Well, that's, that's different. Uh, You'll learn be ready French. for France in no time, Sarah. I know, exactly. So if you go ahead, and what's nice is that if you say, okay, well, this whole learn French survival phrases, French volume one, okay, that, that sounds good, but is it going to be the right kind of audio book for me? You can listen to an excerpt and get a sense of what it's like. Hello, and welcome to French survival phrases. This course is designed to equip you with the language skills and knowledge to enable you to get the most out of your trip to France. So join us for French Survival Phrases. 
Hello, my name is Julian, and I will be your language teacher and cultural guide throughout this introductory course. In France, the language and culture are like it's wine and cheese, rich, delicate, and complex. We'll learn all the right phrases and tips to make sure your trip is a feast, wherever your destination may be. Well, I haven't heard any French yet, but he sounds like a very nice guy, doesn't he? He sure does. Definitely. So that's learn French uh, survival phrase. This is, this is the sort of thing where I could say, okay, well, that's great. Hmm. 749, oh, well, here's the deal. So that if you go to audiblepodcast.com slash social hour, any audiobook of your choice, anything in Audible's library is yours for free. Yes, free book. Isn't that wonderful? Awesome. Yeah, absolutely. Awesome. That's very cool, Sarah. I get, you know, it's funny because I, I guess uh, I haven't really thought about uh, learning another language, but uh, I take advantage of that possibly maybe uh, spanish you love to learn spanish it'll be uh how we do <laughs> well you can teach yourself spanish i'll do my best to not uh butcher the french language and we can Perfect. sort of communicate with each other i love it it's a great idea <laughs> that'll be our next podcast we'll see how that goes <laughs> yeah. um, all right, Sarah, so uh, we have uh, a news item here about YouTube. Um, it's funny because I was uploading a video to YouTube, I think about a week ago, and I was thinking, why can I not edit this video right in the browser? Why do I have to go out and edit it in you know, QuickTime Pro or something? And because I'm just trying to trim it just slightly. Uh, well, YouTube has announced that they've just added uh, video editing tools right into the browser so that you can edit your videos in the browser. Um, which is awesome because you know if you were to re-upload a video, video, oftentimes you lose comments and all that good stuff that you've worked on to build up uh, the community around that video. So you also add effects, uh, change contrast, uh, uh, brightness, uh, rotation, all those things. You have the ability to uh, populate those. Now yeah, it's it's great. If you the, uh, YouTube put together a really simple tutorial um, where they show that you, know, you can you can stabilize an image, you can clean up the color a bit. Um, it's, it's simple stuff, but anybody who's taken a video on the fly knows, oh, wow, you know, it was backlit. I wish it, uh, you know, hadn't been so dark or I was, you know, shooting it out of a moving car, that kind of thing. It's nice to get a little bit of, uh, these sort of, you know, these, these sort of effects type of a thing. I love the idea, but Amber, I can't figure out how to make it work in my YouTube account. So, Chad, if you want to look at my screen, so if I go to my videos area, um, it'll even tell me here, I've got a nice alert that says, new, edit your videos on YouTube to make them shine, learn more. It'll take me to the blog post about it. But now on each video that I've uploaded, I don't have very many videos because I kind of use my YouTube account just as, I don't know, places just to dump B-roll and things like that. But I've got a video here of my cat's licking each other. And there's a nice little edit video button. So I went, okay, well, that wasn't the best color. Maybe I'll, I'll edit the video. But it takes me to the video page and there's no edit area. So I'm not sure if YouTube is simply rolling this out slowly and I'm only about halfway there, or if this is some sort of a Chrome browser issue, which is weird because you'd think that Chrome and YouTube would work, although you don't expect too much from uh, the way that the Chrome works with anything, gross. so I'm not. I'm not. I, I. I would love to try this out, but I. My functionality is not there yet. I don't know if anybody has had the same experience, but uh, yeah. Reverb Mike says his is working in Chrome fine, so I'm just not sure what's going on. I did read. I thought, well, is it? Does it have to do with your account or if like monetization is turned on or anything like that? I mean, it isn't in my case. They said something like. If your video is not necessarily considered viral, but if there are uh, over a thousand views, which for that that's really good for a lot of people, they won't give you a chance to go in and edit a video, maybe because it's already been embedded so many other places, or it's just sort of like it's already popular on its own, and we don't want people going in and messing with it. But none of my videos are even in that category because I don't really publicize this account. It's kind of just my own little playground. So I'm not sure what's going on, but I like the idea. 
Yeah, it's uh, just to pick up on what you're saying, Sarah, about uh, uh, the whole YouTube experience. It, it's it's funny because I find I use YouTube. I feel like I don't use YouTube to its full potential. Like I should be using it more and adding more stuff there. Um, uh, nonetheless, I'm try I've started to try to clean up my YouTube page a little bit. So I think this video thing for me personally will just help with the editing. Uh, yeah. Well, you know, do more there. Exactly. It, YouTube has um, given people a chance to edit their videos with a built-in video editor, it's actually, a, it's, they, they bought a company and they merged and so there were tools there available already as far as trimming the video and this and that. But it was definitely not from within the browser page at the video itself. So this mm -hmm. seems like a, a great upgrade for people who want to just edit lightly on the fly and not have to launch another page and import your video and, and or, or use any sort of external program either. I am just going to just keep patiently waiting um, to get the functionality myself. A couple people in chat said, maybe you're not using the latest version of Chrome. Like a couple other people said, yeah, I don't see it either. So um, yeah. hopefully, it'll, hopefully it'll show up. It's funny because the Read Write Web article made it sound like it was already there and available for people, but uh, yeah, maybe they're just rolling it over time. Um, Sarah, there's another social uh, network online called Early, which uh, just launched. It's just E-R-L-Y. We have to spell everything on the social hour because you never know how something's actually spelled. It's true. Um, and it's kind of interesting. I don't know if you played around with it. Um, the concept is it allows you to build a collaborative photo album um, with notes, videos, and everything. So basically like a, a, you know, a social stream for you and your friends or your network as well. And you can do this all yeah, so I um, I went ahead and went into early, E-R-L-Y dot com. It's funny, it's funny that you say we have to spell everything out. It's like, for our audio listeners, I know you guys appreciate that, but you wouldn't, video listeners, it's like, yeah, you still, you never know. Is it early as in early in the day? No, it's actually without an A. So I went ahead and built a collection. It was really easy. I just signed up for an account. I made a, the Social Hour collection. So I've, I, I just figured, okay, well, in a perfect world, uh, this, it would not be a one-woman collaboration here. Um, the whole idea is to have a bunch of contributors to add to collections together. So if I wanted to add a contributor, since Amber is in my Google contacts and I've already set up my collection to, um, to be able to pull from Flickr photos and, and my Gmail contacts and my YouTube account, these are all um, accounts that it's easy to hook it up with, um, I could find Amber in... in uh, well, are you in there? Oh, those are all my, uh, yeah, Facebook friends and, and contacts. So then we would be collaborating together. So, But this is all stuff that I just added on my own. But it was very easy to do that. Um, I added Amber's update that she was going to snazzy take out last night from Twitter. <laughs> that was a link. Um, embedded a video. This was Social Hour episode 21. Here's a picture that I added, which was when we were still setting up our brick house. We're the living room chairs that I'm sitting in now. Um, here's just this picture of me that's in my Facebook uh, collection. Uh, another picture from a friend of mine's Facebook collection, which is kind of cool. If you go in and say you want to add a photo, um, not only will it pull up my Facebook albums, but it'll put, pull up albums of people who are my Facebook friends. Now, I believe yeah. these will also have to be... I was going to say these would have to be people who are also signed up with early, but I can't imagine that my friend Heather knows anything about early because she just, she's usually not so interested in these social networks uh, as early as we are. So I'm not sure why certain people are showing up, but that's kind of fun. Although yeah. I don't know if Eileen Rivera wants me to use all of her, you know, pictures in her albums for my own collection. Uh, Flickr collection as well. These are all, again, um, services that I've, I've said, yes, I want um, early to pull uh, from this data to build collections. But I love the idea if you were at a wedding um, or you know, some sort of a party or some sort of a work event or just anything where, you know, you're going away for the weekend with a bunch of people, um, even after the fact. So this is something that people could be adding to while you're having a, you know, a fun weekend at the beach type of a thing. Or afterwards, what you can do is, let's say you've decided to put together a collection. And you think, okay, I was with 20 of my great friends and everybody was taking pictures, but I just, you know, it's all over the place and I don't want to troll Facebook all day trying to figure out where all the pictures are. You can send a request. So in the request area, upper right here, I can say, 
uh, whatever I want to and sort of blast out to all the people that I've added to the collection. Like, hey, everybody, please throw in your pictures here or what was your favorite moment or, you know, what was the best quote that you heard this weekend, that kind of thing. So I, I think the service is really awesome. I think that they have to work on their layout a little bit. I mean, mm -hmm. as you can see, your, your video is kind of, it's small and then we've got a big uh, image here and then we've got a bunch of dead gray space and your Twitter link is ridiculously big for no real reason because uh, your avatar is so small. But the collaboration part of it is awesome. It's very cool. Yeah, you know, it's, I think we um, looked at a service last week as well where it seems as more companies that are coming into the social space are actually developing almost like platforms where all you're doing is like pulling in feeds from other places. Um, I think it was that Twitter service that we looked at where you could build your own kind of Twitter web page that was based on your links that you had sent out. Mm -hmm. um, so it's fun to see people uh, figure out ways to take all of this content that's available and, you know, push it into a format like this. But I do agree. It needs a little bit of work. Um, but once they iron things out, awesome collaborative tool. Yeah, it's, 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 I, I, the idea is perfect. And I'm sure that they're going to roll out um, relationships with more services so you can pull in even more data. But for now, photos, videos, text, and links um, is a really good start. And I mean, even fan, it's, it's like it doesn't even really have to be event based. I'm trying to think of, okay, well, what are all the really good ways that early could make use of collections for people? I mean, just even, I've got a, I've got a, w one of the only Facebook groups I use regularly is with my family. And we're talking about what we're going to do during the holiday season this year. We're all going to, actually, we're going to rent a house at the beach. It's exactly what we're going to do. And it's like, this seems to, like this would be a great thing for my aunts and uncles to contribute to because. It's pretty easy to understand, it's easy to use, and it keeps us from having these long email threads back and forth where pictures are added oh, and it just gets very complicated. So yeah, I, th I think it has a lot of promise. Yeah, it's really, it's definitely uh, one to watch, Sarah. Um, now, uh, for our social tip this week, I came across this article on Mashable and it talked about the must-have social accessories. So social media uh, accessories or products that would be uh, only of interest probably to people who are so uh, deep into the social space like we are. Uh, the first one I, I saw, which I thought was kind of fun, it's called Tweet Books. Um, and it allows you to create almost like a, a coffee table book of all of your Twitter messages that you've ever sent out, which is, you know, it's, it's kind of historical in the sense that it sort of documents your life over the time that you've used Twitter. So uh, these are really slick. Uh, and I think I'm going to have to order one, Sarah. Okay. So Amber, I'm I'm going to burst your bubble here a little bit. Uh, when I first looked at this, I said, oh my gosh, this is awesome. I would love this, but it's only your last 200 tweets. It's not all uh, of your tweets uh. because that would obviously be a very long book for people like us who have, you know, 5,000 tweets or more. Um, Robert Scoble would have like this like so you, big you encyclopedia. You can't actually pick date ranges then. Is that what you're saying? Exactly. It's the oh, last 200 good. tweets. And so I went in and I put together, um, yeah, I just put in my Twitter credentials. Um, I had to tell, tell uh, Twitter, yeah, you know, I want tweet books to use the API. And the problem with it is that when you look at my book, it's, I, okay, so this is the last tweet that I sent was a, was a reply to a friend of mine because I was, trying to watch the Emmys last night and I don't have cable anymore. I was trying to figure out what, how do I do that? And, um, and thank you everybody who reminded me that I really need the over, an over the air antenna. I'm extremely lazy and I haven't gotten around to that yet. But so this is like one of these tweets where I say, well, that was a, that was a reply. It wasn't really like a witty tweet or anything. I wouldn't really want that in there. I can choose to dump it. Okay. Um, it will let me take out tweets, but then now I'm just at 199. So it's like the data that it pulls in, tweet books, is just your last 200 whatever. And then you can filter tweets out. But it's not as cool as you thought it was. You know, I wish, you know what would be really interesting if they did with a service like this? And I'm sure it would be more complicated. But um, let's say it was synced up with like Hootsuite or something where, you know, it's measuring my social analytics. And I could find, I could just get the tweets that um, maybe got retweeted or the, the pictures that got viewed the most or whatever it could mm -hmm. be. So it was like the highlights. Because you're right. I mean, gosh, I, I'm sure I spend, send some pretty uh, meaningless tweets. <laughs> I don't necessarily uh, need those included in a book. But I do like the concept that you can kind of take that Twitter experience and, and port it over somewhere else. Um, but if they do customize it a little bit, I think it, it would be a fun gift for someone. Yeah, if you could choose a date range, imagine. I mean, if you were, let's say you took, 
a week vacation somewhere or however long it was and you could say okay here's my day range um, and because everything that you tweeted maybe was hashtag with you know the name of your trip or whatever I mean <laughs> that's actually what I did on my last trip but but um, that that would be okay this is a fun meaningful book because it's stuff that I was talking about that I associate with you know a very positive time in my life that sort of thing so it, I think that if they give people more options, then it could be really a really cute thing. You know, I could give something to my mom. I mean, right now it's like my mom does not want a tweet book of my last one, 200 tweets. <laughs> oh, I can't imagine does, who would Sarah. want that. <laughs> I wouldn't even want it. <laughs> I'm sure she does. Well, there's other products too. If uh, you're not a fan of that one, there was a bunch. I think they had 10 products in all. I picked some of the ones that I thought were more interesting. Mm -hmm. um, you can uh, customize a pair of sneakers. This is uh, available on Zazzle. Um, uh, so a, sort of a Twitter follow me sneakers so that at the end of your uh, shoe you have uh, the Twitter bird, your username. I thought that was kind of creative. I'm not sure I'd wear them, but I'm going to, I'm sure someone will, Sarah. You know we'll what? The, okay. So uh, this is, I'm going to be Debbie Downer today because I'm looking at these shoes thinking, well, wait a second. Someone's have to be like bear hugging you from the back and looking over your shoulder in order to see your tweet ID. Because yeah, they need to it's turn facing it around. the wrong way. Yeah, I know. But you know what? I wonder if you can customize. You know, you have the ability on Zazzle to customize things. So I wonder if you could just rotate it. Maybe. That makes more sense to me. 180 degrees. Yeah, unless, you know what, Sarah? If, unless you're really egotistical and you want to look down and just see your Twitter handle all the That's time. That's true. <laughs> and I wouldn't put it past um, some of our many peers uh, to, uh, to want that. Oh, so, okay, that one's cute. Look, it's a happy little bird with a cappuccino. <laughs> yeah, yeah, so uh, it's so funny. Um, our final one is uh, the onesie. So if you basically want to get a, a gift for someone, if you have a friend who's having a baby and you want a, a onesie that basically says, you know, an update of when they were born, you know, proud parents are, you know, this person and that person, this is a, a fun uh, gift for them, just making it like a status update uh, that uh, the baby came into the world at a certain time. That, okay, this one, even though I am not a parent, I would see another kid wearing this and go, oh my gosh, that's really cute. So cute Where did right? they get that? Yeah, that's a, not only is it just such a fun, geeky thing for a baby to wear, but it would be such a good gift. Yeah, totally. So basically the book needle work, the sneakers need to be rotated, but the onesie is good to go. Nice. Good. <laughs> good work. Who would have uh, thought the onesie would have been my favorite of them all? I don't know. I like the book. I still, I, I just feel like I put so much out on Twitter. I, anything I'm interested in, if any of our uh, listeners, our viewers have found services that allow you to take your Twitter information and do creative things with it, I would love that. Because I feel like I'm, that's where I'm kind of sharing the moments from my life, as mundane as they may be at some time. Uh, sometimes. So um, let us know if you hear uh, of any other services like that, allow you to take that information. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, now, the next link, uh, you found this, Amber. I had never heard of it before, and it's certainly not the only company to try to bring Instagram to the web. Of course, mm -hmm. anybody uh, not familiar with Instagram, uh, it's for iOS users only right now and has been um, for, gosh, how long has it been out now? Over a year now? Uh, well, some, somewhere around that time. A while. Yeah, yeah. I mean, it's, it's, it's been a while. Um, for a service as popular as it is, um, that's the number one complaint is people say, iOS only? I mean, come on. But there are services that, 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 that help um, bring it to the web. There's, there's a Mac app called Carousel that I've been using that helps you enjoy Instagram but not have to actually be on your iPhone or your iPad. But Instagram, so that's <laughs> Instagram with a K after the first after the end, uh, is, is completely new. Where did you find this? I can't even remember where I found Oh, you know what? I might have found it on shinyshiny.tv. I'm trying to expand uh, the, my horizon as far as the different social sites I go to because I'm always going to Mashable, Read, Write, Web. Um, I'm sure you have, have some of the same habits as well as TechCrunch. Um, so I'm trying to branch out for them. So I, from that a little bit, I found shinyshiny.tv to be really helpful. It's based in the UK and just has some neat little social media links. But this is kind of fun. You're right. There are lots of services that do this, Sarah. Um, but I found I love the interface on this one. I mean, I just loaded it up, my own uh, um, uh, username and password. I just love the layout of all the photos. And I mean, it's just a better experience than scrolling through pictures on my iPhone. Man, me too. I think this is actually the best web experience I've yes. seen <laughs> with, with, with Instagram. Yeah. Nice. It, because... 
So here, all right, so here's a picture um, of somebody who actually I don't know, but she, I think it's a she, uh, takes a lot of pictures of San Francisco that I like. So I go ahead, I'm looking at my feed right now. I clicked the photo, so now I'm into this photo's permalink. Um, let's me know uh, where the photo was taken, um, which of course you can toggle on and off if you're an Instagram user. There are 12 likes so far, there are zero comments. I can like it, uh, so now there's 13 likes. I can comment, awesome shot. I don't want to yell, so I won't do it in all caps. Um, uh, it also allows me a variety of emoticons, which is something that you can add to your iPhone. Um, you know, you basically add another keyboard, but it's kind of a popular thing on Instagram to you know give people little heart emoticons, that kind of thing. When you like their picture, um, this is also a permalink that you can send that you can send out you can also share this photo uh, with a variety of you know Twitter Facebook um, there's a link then I can also just go to my photos um, and these are all photos that I took or I uploaded um, I didn't actually take this photo of me when I was little but I thought it was funny because I'm with an inflatable robot and look and see who you know all the people who liked it and and um, where I had upload the photo um, I can remind myself what I have liked in the past. Um, and then albums is something completely new. I've never seen this with any other service. Uh, quickly share and create online Instagram hashtag photo albums. So as far as um, we were talking about vacations, when I went to Hawaii earlier in the year, I, I hashtagged everything. And I could, I could make now an album of all those pictures rather than just scroll back um, and have to find, you know, that, that time period each time. So I think this is, I mean, you have your really popular slant. page and you've got some other settings, but this works better than even Carousel, which is, a, so far, I, I've thought it was the best experience. This uh, is the, um, the OS X app, uh, which works really well, too. You can see I have it running over Instagram where you see your photos, um, so that, but then it's like, you still need to click a few more times. You know, I had to click yeah. like, and then I had to click like again. So I, I like Instagram a lot. Well, Instagram, it, you know, the one thing about it that I found, it was like an, I, in, I instantly loved it. You know, I went in there, it was so simple. Um, like you just mentioned, I loved that I could see all the people I'm following. Finally, all their photos, I could just, you know, go through them. And there's so many great pictures. And I just, I don't have that same experience on my iPhone. So um, it, it's uh, definitely uh, one of the best that I've seen out there. So uh, hopefully, yeah, they, they stick around for a while, Sarah. Me too. <laughs> now they just need to um, add some sort of upload functionality and you wouldn't even need an iPhone at all. But uh, that's... One day, yeah, Sarah. One, one day, day. One day, the web experience. I have heard that the Instagram team is working on some sort of a web experience that's you know going to blow what they do now out of the water. I hope that happens sooner than later, uh, you know, early Christmas present or whatever. But in the meantime, yeah, definitely try out in Instagram, even if you already do use the iOS app, because when you're on your computer and you don't have your phone handy, it's just, it's a, it's, it's a, it's a really good find, Amber. We, yeah, um, we got a lot of viewer feedback this week and I wanted to start out off with one from Maria, who uh, sent us something that was just, I mean, it was really very touching um, and has to do with how powerful it can be to meet people online and, and create friendships. So I thought that I would read it to you guys. Uh, hi, Sarah and Amber. I just wanted to share a little story about how social networks are he helping to raise awareness of TSC as a condition and epilepsy and a little boy named Jack in Texas. In 2008, I became a member of a site called Baby Center and I started frequenting message boards for groups of moms whose babies were all due to arrive in March of 09. As time went on and our babies grew up, about 50 of us became very close and we created our own little subgroup. I've done that before. It sounds familiar. This has turned into a place where we chat about our lives, our families, our our jobs and also learn through each other good times and bad these ladies have become some of my best friends they'd all say the same thing and most of us have never met face to face as we're spread out all over the place um, one of the moms has a son named Jack who has TSC this causes him to have seizures this month he's going to be having surgery to remove a part of his brain and we decided to dedicate the month to Jack and help raise awareness of epilepsy and TSC and we've been doing this by posting facts on Facebook daily. We've created a Facebook group. Uh, we've been also handing out physical bracelets uh, with our saying, and the saying is seize hope. And our goal isn't to raise money. It's just awareness and uh, generate uh, lots of thoughts and prayers for a little boy and his family. And thanks to social media, 
Um, it's become very special to lots of people across the country. Um, and then she goes on to say, I know some people think, so, think it's odd to have a group of friends like this, to have such a deep connection with people you only know through the internet, but I'm thankful that these sorts of sites like message boards and even Facebook are available. These people have become a huge part of my life and have been there to support me through all sorts of things. Oh, wow. I know. I, it's, I really, this kind of resonated with me, Amber, because um, when um, my dad passed away a few years ago, my mom was, um, well, I mean, obviously it was, it was hard to cope for everybody, but she um, was involved with a grief group um, who had, it was, it was sort of a similar type of a thing where she really got um, a lot of support and uh, I think a lot of peace through um, connecting with other people. And these are people that, you know, you just, she might not have run into or ever met or had the chance to bounce ideas off to otherwise. So I thought, wow, you know, this is not only awesome for Maria to send this to us, but um, it really reminds you that people can be awesome. And social media is such a great way to meet awesome people. Oh, yeah, it's amazing. You know, we sometimes, I think, get a little bit wrapped up in the whole Twitter world because it's so instant. You know, it's like that in instant gratification, right? You can go there and everything's so digestible. Uh, but the real communities online are communities like this. You know, the real people who have, you know, they, they have these deep connections. So it's so nice to hear um, about that story. Uh, now we have uh, another email, Sarah, and uh, this is about social media and sports. Mm -hmm. um, I'll read this one. This is from, I believe, uh, Jerry. Uh, actually, sorry, not is it Jerry? Yeah, it's yeah, Jerry. It's Jerry Matthew. Okay. Um, yeah, I always get confused if it's Matthew Jerry or Jerry Matthew. Um, <laughs> right. It's like the same first name thing. Ah. Um, he says, uh, I was watching uh, the social hour today and heard our conversation about social media in the pro sports world. And he says, maybe the cheeseheads have their own little community, but they're off in their own little world. Well, they can still claim the world champion title for the short time. They'll uh, For the short time, they'll have it. Ha ha. Uh -huh. uh -huh. Anyway, I checked out one of my hometown teams, my beloved Chicago Cubs, and their use of social media. While they, while they don't have an online community like the Packers, do they do have several official Twitter feeds for players. Some of the beat writers use their accounts for postings and blogs. They also have a message board for fans, wherever they are. It looks like both of these through MLB, so they don't have anything independent of the league, or so it appears. I enjoy watching, lis listening to you guys on the net. It breaks up my day. Um, and he says he can relate to uh, our show at work um, in terms of getting around the firewall place. That's always entertaining. Um, and he's it's the fun and informative show. So thank you so much for uh, sending us that. Um, uh, yeah, lots of sports communities. I don't tend to hang out in these communities as much, Sarah, but as I learned from uh, you last week with your screaming at the game, any chance you're a member of any of these communities, the sporting ones? <laughs> well, you know, I'm glad Jerry reminded us because, of course, this is in, in, in response to the gentleman the week before who was like, the Packers have this great social media website, and it looks like uh, what Jerry has found for his beloved Cubs um, are more MLB, uh, I mean, it's... These aren't like rogue social networks. This is stuff that the MLB has put together so fans mm -hmm. of certain teams can get together and, and chat about stuff. But there's message boards and obviously a, a destination to go to and people talking about their favorite players and this and that. I mean, I'm not a Cubs fan, although I have nothing against the Cubs. But this is the sort of thing where I can see myself getting into it you know, it's, not, it's all about the community, right? So it's like if I, if I thought that the tone of, of like-minded fans of, you know, the Giants, that's, you know, my baseball team, for example, were, were the kind of people I wanted to hang out online with, I really love this stuff. I think it's great. Um, and kudos to the MLB for at least giving people a place to hang out um, and talk amongst themselves. And fans are, fans are a special breed. I mean, they, they, they like what they like. Um, it's very hard to argue with them. Um, but when you have like-minded people, I mean, you could have nothing in common except your love of a sports team and all of a sudden your best friend. So definitely, um, it's cool. Thank you, Jerry, for letting us know that there are a lot of <laughs> support groups for sports fans out there, no matter what your team is, um, or at least if it's Major League Baseball. That's awesome. Uh, now, Sarah, we have a video from someone I see, which is always fun. Yeah, Jeremy, who uh, says he's J.D. Carty in chat, uh, had a recommendation for us. Hi guys, this is Jeremy Carty from Charlotte, North Carolina. I was at the Big Nerd Ranch in July with a developer for an app that I thought you guys might be into. It's called Holler. If you go to holler.com, 
you will see it. It looks like it's about like the website or the app that you reviewed related to getting people together for drinks, but this reaches into your social sec social circle, lets you holler, see who wants to get together for lunch, dinner, whatever. So check it out. Let me know what you think. Thanks, guys. Love the show. Fun. Very fun. Uh, holler I'm part of that. Hi, guys. This is Jeremy Car Just the once, Chad. Thank you. I'm just kidding. Uh, good times. Uh, yeah, so Holler, it's, it, if you go to holler.com, my first reaction is, wow, that's a pretty good domain. I mean, Netflix has resorted to Quickster, and <laughs> you've got holler.com. That's, that, that's a great name for a service. And I love the idea that it's all about, uh, hey, I want to go get pizza in an hour, who's around type of a thing. Uh, my concern is that it sounds like a lot of other services that offer this. Um, mm. f you know, Facebook, for, for, for example, is now offering, it's, it's like a way to check into something in the future. You know, like I can say, I'm looking forward to seeing this movie tonight and actually um, use location to check into the particular theater I'm going to go to and tag a friend that I'm going to be with later type of a thing. Um, but... And I haven't actually had a chance to use the app, um, although I can enter my email address now uh, to, to uh, good. So now I'm, now I'm on the list. Oh, it's available in the App Store. Wait. Oh, I, great. Now I just got on their mailing list. Good work, Sarah. Uh, but, uh, but yeah, so this is somebody wants to hang out. Uh, they want to hang out. They're in a certain area. And obviously, you, you, um, it works with friends. So if five friends are using it and a couple people are down near the beach, you know, I might swing by type of a thing. I don't know how much more uh, Holler would give me, I guess with all the geolocation that's built in, that could be a lot more helpful than uh, sending a blast out maybe on in a text or Facebook messenger and just saying, hey, I'm down at the beach, anybody around and, you know, want to get a soda type of a thing. But this seems like a, like a great service. It certainly looks nice. I have to assume that whoever made Holler is San Francisco-based because all of their little, um, their example locations. Are all from there? Are all from there, yeah. Surfing at Ocean Beach, Bridge to Bridge Runners, Bernal Height Dog Walkers. Yeah, that sounds like San Francisco. <laughs> uh, I'm not sure. I'm not sure where I lost you, Amber. But what what do you think about Holler? I I I was just saying that it it seems like this overlaps with what some other services I can think of do. But it certainly looks good, and it seems like as long as you could get enough people to be using it together, it could be really helpful. Yeah, I mean, I think it, it again. It is in a it's in a category of services that is a, it's a little bit saturated right now. I think uh, as far as connect people, you know, you have everything from kind of group messaging to other services like Holler. So, um, you know, it's one of those services, Sarah. If it works, if it's free, and your friends love it, and you're using it, hey, you know, there's no harm done, right? Exactly. <laughs> it can but, only be a good thing. But that's the issue: is that there are so, you know, like you said, there, it's a saturated market for a lot of apps that. There's nothing wrong with any of these apps, but it's just that they all do not necessarily the exact same thing, but on a consumer level, similar things, and they just can't all win. I mean, oh, we're I not all going to use five different apps that do similar things. We're going to use one that most people are already on. I mean, that's, I think, why Foursquare has kind of uh, retained its, you know, uh, championship as the geolocation app of choice. A lot of people don't think it's the best app, but it's just where a lot of users have remained. So it's like, why jump ship when you know that not everybody's jumping with you? Well, I mean, I think if you remember at the at the end of the day, I mean, there's room for hundreds of thousands of apps. You know, it's just like when websites launched in the you know late 1990s when they started to become kind of popular. It was one of those things like, ah, I don't know if this is going to last, but the, you know, some of those sites are still around. They just don't get a lot of traffic. So I think it's going to be the same thing. The app marketplace is some of these apps may you know get a, a it could be a few hundred or a few thousand users, but um, hey, if that's all their their developers want and they're okay with that, they they could be around for a while. You just never know. Exactly. Or I guess now uh, the, there's the exit strategy strategy where it's like if you've got a proven model that's built really solid, uh, you get gobbled up by a larger company who says, well, I just, we just like what you're doing and we don't want to build it from scratch either. Um, not that that's why people should be making great services, but I know that that is something that 
oh, is yeah. happening with more and more frequency as of late, and it's definitely an attractive proposition for people who want to turn a profit. Oh, for sure. Um, so, Sarah, we uh, are, we have a couple more things, and then we have a rat or five later on, of course, which is is kind of fun, and it has to do with uh, going to the potty. That's I'll right. The rest of you. <laughs> Thanks for saying that. So I didn't have to. Um, <laughs> just a reminder: we we do want to hear from everybody. We love getting your feedback, your videos, um, it, it, your your emails, especially you know all the heartfelt stuff. It's it's great. You know, we haven't gotten a voicemail in a while, um, at least not one that was about 30 seconds or less that was kind of nice and clear and concise. So I just want to remind you guys, 2626-SOCIAL. That's 2626-S-O-C-I-A-L is our Google Voice number. Call us. Tell us anything. Just try to keep it concise. Of course, you can email us at the social hour at twit.tv. Or if you want to record a video... Uh, like like our friend JD did, well, Jeremy, um, please do so. He uploaded it to Vimeo, which was great. He just sent us an email that had the URL in there, and we were able to play it. YouTube works fine, too, or pretty much any other video site um, that will host your video. Just don't send us any attachments because we don't want to have to download video. Before we get to Amber's Ratter Fad, we do want to thank Netflix. Oh, yes, I said it. Netflix, they are a sponsor of the Social Hour. And you know what? We love them. I use Netflix almost on a daily basis because I love their streaming service. And guess what? Their streaming service is still called Netflix. So, <laughs> so, so Netflix is great. Uh, here, here's the deal. Here's the deal. Let's put aside all of the drama that's going on with Netflix right now and think about one of your friends that likes to watch movies and TV shows. Okay, so think of a friend, any friend. Do you have a friend in mind? Great. So here's the deal. The friend doesn't use Netflix, but loves to watch movies and TV shows, even whole TV series. Maybe the friend never got into Buffy, or never got into Mad Men, and you're like, God, you really are missing out. Man, you, you suck. You really need to get on board. Here's what you can do. You send your friend to netflix.com slash twit. The friend goes ahead, goes ahead and signs up for an account. It's totally free, very easy to do. And they get 30 days free Netflix content. 30 days free. No strings attached. At the end of those 30 days, they, they can either say, okay, cool, that was a nice free gift. Thank you, friend. Or they can uh, say, you know, I love Netflix. I love this whole streaming thing. This is awesome. Now I'm going to sign up for an account because I want to have Netflix streaming at the ready all the time. Like I do. What, one of the nice things about Netflix is that, so not only do you say to your friend, here's all this free content, but let's say your friend is pretty tech savvy. You know, they might have an iPad and uh, Xbox 360 and, you know, they've got one of those fancy um, TVs that have widgets where they can have a Netflix widget as well. They've got a Roku box. All of those are ways that they can watch Netflix content. You can even start watching Netflix on your Wii, for example, and then pause it. And then you got to go, you, know, you got to, I don't know, you got to go to the dentist. And then you bring your iPad to the dentist and you finish watching whatever you were watching at home on your iPad because Netflix remembers where you left off. It's amazing. You can look at their, uh, their instant streaming uh, uh, collection on their website just to get a sense of new and old and everything in between, stuff for families, dramas. I mean, they, they've got a really good collection uh, at netflix.com slash twit. But again, I, you know, I, I can't stress enough. Give somebody a free gift. You don't have to pay anything, and they're still going to love you. <laughs> it's the perfect. It's the perfect cheap date. There is no cheaper date. It's good. It's <laughs> always good. Uh, so, Sarah, I'm just going to do for our radar fat. I know we have a couple options. I'm going to do Clue because it's uh, it's fun. Okay. Um, and we, we uh, talked about this briefly last week because somebody had actually uh, suggested actually it, but you didn't know that. And so, yes, now we get to talk about it at length. Um, at I'm length. very excited about this one. And I also wanted to mention um, in the same category as Clue is uh, an app from Charmin. I'm not sure if you're familiar, familiar with it, but Charmin, the toilet paper makers, put out an app um, not that long ago, and uh, it allows you to find public restrooms. And uh, you can find public restrooms, you can rate public restrooms. So a very innovative idea, I think, for a social media campaign for a toilet, uh, toilet paper maker to come out with something fun like this. And I know within the first few weeks, they had something like 50,000 downloads. So a big success for them. Um, well, in the same category, uh, like we just briefly mentioned last week, is the Clue app. Um, this isn't uh, public restrooms, it's residential bathrooms that are uh, being made available to the public uh, for a price, and you can find them through the, the app. So uh, I guess there's a trend right now, Sarah, in terms of uh, finding uh, bathrooms uh, through applications. This is, 
This <laughs> is one of the weirdest ideas ever. And I understand where they're going with this. It's like there's the whole Airbnb thing where you've got an apartment and maybe you're not in it all the time and why don't you just make money uh, by pay, you know, setting a price for someone to stay there provided that they don't trash it. Get around is that service where you can do the same thing with your car. Let's say you have a convertible and you know for a fact you're not going to be using it this ne coming up next weekend. You could say $50 a day um, f to, to rent it out and that's what, what get around as a service does where you, you rent out your car for a certain price and then you kind of have to you know just hope that there aren't insurance issues when somebody wrecks it. Get, uh, and Clue is now I've got a bathroom if you're in my area, you can use it for a fee. Now, the whole idea is that it's like a friends of friends type thing. So it's not just like any random Joe off the street using your toilet. But I also feel like, Amber, that... Um, how do I say this delicately? Here, it's very hard. This is, this is... I don't even really want my friends to use my bathroom unless they really have to. I mean, it's yes, it's there. If you come over and you need to go, you go. But it's like, I don't think even my good friends, if they were in the general vicinity of my apartment, I really want them pinging me that often to just come, run upstairs really quick and use the bathroom. Um, yeah. So weird. that's why I'm like, I don't know. I mean, a friend of a friend, this is already getting weird. And what if they've had something bad for lunch and... I'm really inconvenienced oh, now. Oh, Sarah, you went there. You went there. I, do, I feel like it's my duty to bring these things up. Yes, you're just speaking the truth, Sarah. It's something not many people can do. Uh, but uh, you know what? You're right. I mean, as far as a rat or fad, I think this is a little bit of a fad. I mean, are people really going to want to open their houses up to let people, you know, come in, even if it is within their own network and go to the bathroom? I'm not really sure um, that this is going to catch on. Although I like the Charmin idea where the toilet paper maker talks about public restrooms that are clean because there's nothing worse than a public restroom that is not clean um, and you can't find anyone. So I do love that that uh, that uh, uh, idea that Charmy came out with. Um, as far as on the residential side, I think it's, you know what, I don't even really want to go into, you know, many people's houses either and go to their restroom. You know, I think it's one of those things. It's like a, it's a very private room, Sarah. Exactly. I feel like, okay, so let's say I'm not the one with the, the apartment with the available loo. But I'm someone yeah. who's like, oh, a friend of a friend might have a bathroom around here. It's, you know, it's an emergency. It's like grocery stores have bathrooms, too. I mean, they're not always the cleanest, but it's like it's not oh, too difficult to figure out, you know, where there's a Starbucks nearby or somewhere that, you know, a lot of the little mom and pop stores either don't have bathrooms or they say that they don't because they don't want you in there. But a lot of chain stores do. I guess if you were in a rural area and, and somebody just happened to be using Clue and it really saved you, then you'd be so happy that this app existed. But yeah, I'm going to go with fad too. I just do not see this being something that catches on uh, in any sort of major way. I, yes. I'm a little grossed out by it. <laughs> yeah, so basically we can put Clue into the category of it being a fad. And maybe Charmin sit or squat is kind of rad because then that allows us to use the public space, public bathrooms, and uh, make sure that they're clean. So uh, we have two apps, one rad, one fad. Perfect. Sounds good. Well, with that, Amber, uh, now that we've gotten all of our potty humor out of the way, I think that I should let you um, continue your journey back home. You are uh, on your way back to Toronto now, aren't you? Yeah, I think my flight is leaving in a, uh, about an hour, so so I should probably go check in. I'm, uh, you know, I, I have to get focused and get home. And uh, um, it's been good being on the show, Sarah, as always, and it's been fun coming to you uh, from uh, Houston, Texas. Well, it's been great to see you. Your hat is lovely. Uh, Thank your you. video is frozen, but I can hear you just fine. And it's actually a really cute video, uh, cute screenshot good. of you. Oh, there awesome. you are. Leave You're it. back. Yeah, it's good. We we got through the show. I mean, Wi-Fi in airports can sometimes be a little iffy, and this was it, it worked out pretty well. Pretty it worked well. out pretty well. It's all it's all good, Sarah. Better than being in the car, let's just say. Yeah, oh yeah. <laughs> <laughs> what isn't? Yeah. It's nice that you're not overheating in your car in the dead of summer, Amber. All right, well, that's it for this edition of the Social Hour. A reminder, anybody who wants to watch us live, if you're watching us on demand, thank you so much for subscribing or watching off of our website. If you want to watch us live, 2 p.m. Eastern, 11 a.m. Pacific on Mondays, or you can always watch us on demand. Subscribe via our iTunes feed, video, audio feeds. Everything's at our website. We make it as easy as possible for you to watch our show, um, whoever you want to. So thanks so much. I'm Sarah Lane.
And I'm Amber McCarthy, and we'll see you next week. See you guys.